black ball. Black 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 ball. What is up, everybody? My name is James D. Fiore, and this is Blackballed. If you joined the Dean Blundell podcast today, you would have seen us interview a... Uh, sometimes I don't know how to describe him, but he self, he's a self-professed sort of fixer in the what I would call the shadowy world of the political dark arts. And <clears throat> if you noticed, uh, the podcast blew up. Um, David Wallace is his name, and we interviewed him for almost two hours. And what came out of that interview, what we've been, what we're able to glean out of that interview, was that we live in a cesspool of political corruption in this country, and uh, we live in uncertain times right now. If you're joining me just now, you probably already know that Doug Ford has won a majority in the province of Ontario. Um, the Liberals finished a distant third. Uh, the NDP are the opposition. Um, so the places didn't change. I think the Liberals are gonna end up with winning about one more seat than they won uh, the last time. And the uh, the NDP, I think they shrank by uh, 10 to 12 seats. I, I, I don't have it in front of me anymore. And uh, the last count that I had for the Conservative was 80. Um, we are also joined tonight, and this is a little bit of a surprise because it was an 11th hour edition, by businessman Nathan Jacobson. Um, I I may apologize first uh, be, before I introduce Nathan because I didn't know how to describe him because every time, he, he's an interesting guy because I couldn't find, I couldn't even find a Wikipedia page for him, which is interesting because he is like a really successful businessman. I think he worked for the Harper government for a while. I think he was a special envoy to Syria, if I'm not mistaken, to help negotiate peace over there. I'm pretty sure he's friends with like Benjamin Netanyahu. Like he's got a resume that is super impressive <clears throat> and it's also very eclectic. And uh, David actually thought it would be a good idea to have him on the podcast. I, I completely agree. I did a deep dive on both these gentlemen today, and but what I would rather do is just have them talk. And and I think that um, I'd like to introduce right now uh, to David Wallace and to Nathan Jacobson. Gentlemen, how are you today? Oh, I, I didn't like the description of me. The word okay, shadowy, I didn't like. Okay. It, it doesn't mean shady, even though it, they both tend to go where the light is not. Um, but I, it, it was difficult for me to figure out what to, how to describe you, to be perfectly honest. So why don't I just do the polite thing? And I have no problem never calling you that again, sir. But uh, what, how would you describe yourself if someone were to ask you as far as the political arena goes? Uh, in terms of the uh, political arena, um, well, I cross uh, a number of spectrums, but uh, I've always done things in terms of what's the the best internationally and for for governments, and I'm I'm lucky that I've had friends in uh, a variety of governments in different countries. I have okay. multiple citizenship, and uh, I've been lucky enough to to have friends. Yeah, uh, we we all need friends. Um, how did you and David meet? We met through the Patrick Brown matter. Mm. Um, I received a call one day from David, and I'll pass it to David to explain uh, how it was and why he called me. Okay. David? Hi, guys. Um, absolutely. I was uh, back from Moscow for about three or four months, but prior to leaving, 
I had been told uh, by an individual at Gazprom and in Ottawa that the individual I needed uh, to assist me in getting to the bottom of what took place in Ontario during the Patrick Brown coup, um, I would uh, do myself a lot of favors if I hooked up with Mr. Nathan Jacobson. Uh, he would be the only person in Canada who could probably assist me. In fact, he would be the only person who could assist me. Um, those interested in Moscow were kind enough to point me in the right direction. Um, I had heard of Nathan before, of course, when you were in Moscow in the early 90s, uh, you pretty much couldn't not have heard of Nathan. He had a variety of interests. Um, uh, I believe it was uh, Philip Morris Tobacco, um, uh, also the GM uh, uh, distributorship and all kinds of things to do with uh, gasoline and fuel. So I, I certainly knew of the name and um, uh, the friends from the embassy helped me cut down on the legwork in terms of getting in touch with Nathan, which I did. So that's where our story picks up. Okay. Now, um, first, I want to also welcome Ryan Lindley to the show. Ryan, you've only done about 17 hours of podcast today, so I hope you're... Uh, you're <laughs> I was, I was just going to say, I, I, I was just on like a three and a half hour political podcast for the Ontario election, and you took over immediately and didn't give me a chance to pee. And <laughs> I was not, as, as important as what we're doing here tonight is, I was not going to pee in my pants to That's be here for the intro. That's probably a good idea. That's probably a good idea. It's good um, to see you again, David. Good to see you, um, Nathan. So Hi there. Let, let, can we pick this up? Um, David, you mentioned, I believe it was today on the podcast, um, of a... Uh, well, maybe I should be asking this to Nathan. D Nathan, David said on the podcast today that you had um, you you were sort of a political fixture in conservative circles for a long time. Would that be a, a, a fair statement? Uh, in certain provinces and federally, yes. Let's go with Alberta, and then tell me how it, it, if there was like a falling out with the current premier, or or did I mishear that today? There, no, there, there there's been no falling out. Uh, okay. with Jason Kenney. Uh, Jason is a person who I respect a great deal. Um, my knowledge and experience with him is that he is an honest, fair and decent person. Um, I believe he's being misled by some of the people around him. And uh, to a certain extent, you know, coming from having been in federal politics, uh, for so long and stepping back into Alberta and doing what he did and reuniting the party, becoming the head of one party, then reuniting the party, then going through another leadership, um, that he got some hangers on that I think are just the wrong people. They may have had the right credentials at one point, but I don't think that they were doing what was best uh, necessarily for the province of Alberta, nor for Jason. And at one point, I warned him of that, but I, I've never, um, I would never question his integrity. Okay, and I read. I, I'll, I'll reach. I'll happily retract that um, misunderstanding. But it was. Uh, go, I was going from memory. Can you tell us about the hangers-on and the people that are sort of uh, possibly leading him astray, are off the conservative path? And you can can you expand on that a little bit? Well, I, I've met uh, a number of the people uh, around Jason. And uh, again, he, he returned to Alberta as a novice. Um, you know, he, he grew up in, in various provinces. His father was the headmaster at uh, the famous Notre Dame Boys School in Saskatchewan. So, so he grew up there for a part of his life. And he came back to make a difference in Alberta polit politics. Um, how he got uh, connected with a fellow by the name of Alan Holman, um, who to me was described, including by, by, by Holman, as Ralph Klein's fixer, back when, uh, when Klein was the premier of Alberta. Um, and Holman played a role, apparently, in helping to get Jason the leadership. And through Holman, I got to meet... Uh, uh, Gerald Shapur, and an, a number of, of other people um, and came to, to learn about them. And uh, their 
less than ethical people. Uh, Shapur I got largely to, to know um, through David's relationship with him that that also came through uh, through his relationship with uh, with Holman and Shapur is the key bagman for the uh, Conservative Party in Alberta and I would say probably one of the principal bagman influencers behind the scene influencers uh, federally in the in, in the Conservative Party and that that represents um, the extreme right uh, religious fringe um, and knowing politics in a variety of countries, access to bag men and to money is, is important. I, from that statement, and I think you're being careful uh, and, and I don't blame you, but is it, um, are the extreme religious right in Alberta using the political representatives or is it the other way around? How does that work? Um, again, I, I haven't been involved truly in Alberta politics other than through just a pure friendship with Jason and, and a caring about him. But, uh, you know, I've learned about Shapur and I, I've met Holman uh, too many times. Um, Shapur, um, I, I came to know through through David um, when David was retained by Holman and Shapur to uh, help find a person who apparently had arrest warrants for him, a gentleman by the name of uh, Richard Marsh. And uh, David was successful in finding Marsh. Um, but it's a matter of like going hunting in the jungle for a tiger and you find a tiger, what do you do then? And, mm -hmm. and then David came to me about it. And my attitude is if there's uh, criminal warrants for Marsh, then, then I can help to put him in the hands of the uh, legal authorities. And then the, the, the whole story went off the rails in terms of what the, the truth was. And Shapur ended up bringing me uh, and, and uh, David onto a call with uh, some people from the Pilgrim Brethren uh, that went, became a crazy phone call. Um, and, and then later on, it turned out that there were in fact no warrants for Marsh but the Pilgrim Brethren, who Shapur was, was representing and working closely with, uh, wanted, uh, let's say for lack of a better word, to put Marsh on ice. And, and that's when that relationship between myself and them went, went off the rails. When Shapur finally, after telling me that there were all these warrants for uh, Marsh's arrest, finally admitted, because I, I said to him, I can't have them turned over to the police unless there's warrants. I need to see those warrants. And he finally admitted, well, there are no warrants for him. Um, we're working on getting a warrant in Saskatchewan, but that might take a year and a half to do. But in the meantime, we'd like you to grab Marsh and turn him over to us. Uh, upon which point I said, uh, you've got the wrong person. Um, yeah. You know, you came to me under one premise, and basically now what you're talking about is the kidnapping. And I don't know, I, I didn't hear all of David's interview today, but I ended up creating a situation where the Pilgrim Brethren and Shapur and and uh, Holman uh, came to understand uh, that I was going to ensure that nothing happened to Marsh. And Marsh, by the way, I, I have to say, is a person who I, in, in the several meetings I've had with him, is a, a, a real gentleman. And, and I, I use the term gentle. He's a gentleman who um, unfortunately was born into this cult, and this cult has done their best to ruin his life. And 
in the end, what they wanted, one could even believe they wanted him to lose his life, that he was a threat to them. Yeah, it, it, it reminded me, uh, wow. and I'm going to throw it to David in a second, but it reminded me of Scientology, um, the way that they deal with their excommunicated pe- members. And um, and you're right, Nathan. <clears throat> I've talked to um, I've talked to Richard t- three times, I guess, on the phone. He's going to be a guest here tomorrow night, um, and he is a gentleman. He sounds like a perfectly reasonable, rational individual. Um, and and to think that a church, I mean, look, I I, I know people that were raised. Um, in in Orthodox Christian environments, and it's it's never really a good place. Um, but this has a very different kind of ring to it. They are business moguls, and also a cult, um, a religious cult. And and it um, it it bothers me that they seem to be so cozy with certain political personalities. And um, first I of all, agree. I feel the same. Yeah, and and I can tell because you're wearing an infidel shirt. <laughs> I, I got this in Afghanistan. Oh, did you? Okay, wow, well, wow, that's a brave purchase in Afghanistan, my friend. <laughs> it, was, it was a gift from uh, from a special uh, unit there. Okay, um, David, um, when it, I mean, you knew of Nathan Jacobson obviously before this situation, as you mentioned. Um. To me, he's your receipt for this particular story. Because I remember I was talking to you originally about um, everything that happened to Richard Marsh. And uh, it was a fantastic story. And and I asked Richard, you know, what kind of evidence is there that you were possibly being sought after um, to be taken out? And, um, you know, with Nathan here sort of he's like a, our tertiary source in this matter. Now I have three individuals who are all sort of on the same page about what was happening there. What made the, the church or the, or the intermediary Hallman, I guess it would be or Shapur. What would make them believe that this was something that first of all, you would do. And second of all, that you were even capable of doing, because this is not in, in your MO normally. No, actually it's originally it's totally out of my MO. Originally, I imagine it is out of both your MOs for sure. Um, originally, I mean, one of my uh, fortes, I guess you would say, is I can find things, missing things. Um, used to be artwork sometimes for people or or uh, something that was hidden. Uh, I figured I could use it on people. Mostly it was just looking over the work that previous investigators had done and, and looking for the holes and once you get that in totality, you can kind of get an idea of what type of personality you're dealing with and how he may think. Um, and from certain uh, information that was in the files, going back a number of years, the previous investigators had had, I, I got a pretty quick idea of where I could locate him. Not so much geographically, but in what field I would probably be able to find him and uh, work like a charm. Yeah. Um, and it's become... This is going to become, um, if I have anything to do with it, um, you know, a story that that goes viral because I know that the church has had a documentary done. I think it was City TV <clears throat> that did like a, a four or five part series about this church. I haven't watched it yet, but I know a couple people that have and they were like, it reminds everybody of Scientology. Um, now, would you say that because of... I'm one of these believers that sunlight is the best disinfectant is talking about this in public. Finally, uh, is that something that could, and I'll, I'll turn this to you, Nathan. Is that something that you think could ultimately help save his life? Um, in, in terms of Marsha's life. Yeah, I do believe that the more, uh, the darkness and I, I, the word church, it, it goes so much against what a church is supposed to be. But the more the, the pilgrim brethren are exposed uh, for what they do, the safer uh, is the life of Marsh and other people who have left the church, who the church cannot... Uh, uh, they're very threatened by... Uh, by being exposed for for what they are, 
And and what we did is we used uh, my non-business background as something to kind of chase them away. And I, I let them know that uh, he's under my protection. Uh, we led them to understand that, in fact, I've taken him to Israel where they, they can't get him. Um, and he... he they, they couldn't go after him. And I, I, I told them straight out, he's under my protection and nothing is going to happen to him. And if, if I'm correct about this, it's, again, you, you were a tough deep dive because um, I, I, I don't know if you're, uh, if you're one of those um, you know, wealthy individuals that knows how to scrub stories of themselves off the internet. But if you did, then kudos. <laughs> no. Because... Um, no. Well, I, I, call I me. listen, the rumors. Yeah, the, the rumors. Please call. Please call. Yes. P- teach me how to do that. Um, but the rumors of being an Israeli spy. Is that true? There are. Yes, there are rumors of that. There, there's uh, there's a, there's a saying in Hebrew. Go prove that your sister's not a whore. Oh, well, I couldn't if, do that. No, I'm just kidding. If, <laughs> if somebody says your sister's a whore, how are you going to prove that she's not? So, you know, if people... Uh, Hyman? <laughs> you said whore, not Puritan. Yeah, I'm right. going for a double entendre there. I don't know. You, you we got making fun of the church here, James, for Christ's I, sake. Yes, yeah, right. So, so a- anyways, you know, there, uh, I, I'm alleged certain things, and there's no need to go into what's real and what's not real. Uh, I, I am proud I, I did have a... Uh, a good military service in Israel uh, as a youngster from Winnipeg in a good unit. Um, I have done things that are, are public uh, for the state of Israel um, that some people would call risky or dangerous, whatever. Um, but uh, there, there's a reputation. Uh, for example, Kenny had been... Uh, my, with me in Israel on a number of occasions. And for example, I took him to, to meet uh, uh, Netanyahu. I organized for him to meet the head of the intelligence service of the country. Um, I got in trouble with my wife when I took Jason and my then eight-year-old daughter shooting because my, my wife believed that eight-year-old girls shouldn't be shooting. But um, so, so Jason knew my relationships and had seen me elsewhere around the world. Ryan, I'm um, I'm stuck on I'm I'm really stuck on the religious aspect of this and the amount that I thought I knew. I thought I knew a lot of of the involvement that we've we've been talking about, um, especially like today, even today. Now I'm not so sure. How long have we been actually under the proverbial thumb of of this sort of a a, a regime that's been um, plaguing our society here in in Canada uh, when it comes to these guys? Like how long how long has this been a, a problem? Well, I, I can speak as I, I would say I was a political insider and. In, the conservatives in, in, in the days of uh, Prime Minister Harper, who, mm-hmm. who's a man who I, I truly respect for his integrity. And being a, a Jewish person with good relations through the evangelical community, it was never an issue for me. And uh, it, it first came to me um, through seeing what the uh, involvement is of the pilgrim brethren, um, not only within the uh, conservative, right-wing conservative movement within Alberta, but their influence in Ontario and elsewhere. And the key figure from what I've been able to find out, a lot of it being through through David's work, is that a key figure in that the one who pulls the strings and manages the money is Gerald Shapur. And uh, he ended up uh, 
having Dave and myself get on a phone call with three of the, the senior members of the Pilgrim Brethren, this was while they believed that we were going to be bringing in uh, Richard Marsh. And the call ended up being, from their standpoint, uh, seditious and e extreme cr criminality. You're, you're talking about they, they, they wanted to pay for regime change. Yeah. And, and this was Shapur and, and, and three senior people uh, from the Brethren, um, Canadians and Americans. So you're talking about multinational uh, sedition to, there was an offer made uh, to, to name the price. They, they had whatever belief that they had that, and, and there's been articles come out about my being an Israeli assassin or whatever. And they believed that they had people that were willing to do things for money. And it was a matter of name the price uh, to get rid of uh, Prime Minister uh, Justin Trudeau. And I said, what are you talking about? And they said, whatever it takes. And do you have uh, that, that, is that a recorded phone call? No, I don't record calls. Uh, David is better at that than I am. Um, <laughs> that was good. Uh, yeah, but was good. Uh, I, 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 I don't believe it was. But uh, the call ended uh, harshly from my standpoint. Um, I, I know Prime Minister um, Trudeau on on a personal basis from an organization that I had started up uh, when he was, before he entered politics, an organization that I started up with my friend, Martin Luther King III, the son of the slain leader, uh, to bring in children of past leaders. And I wanted a Canadian and I brought Justin in. And, uh, you know, he's, he's a, a very charismatic, charming person. I don't agree with all of his politics. Um, I. I am a conservative. I'm I'm a red Tory, um, but I made it clear that in what they're talking about is is criminal in nature, and that while I may not agree with uh, uh, all of Justin Trudeau's policies, he was democratically elected by my country, and the way we replace leaders uh, in our country is through the ballot box. Absolutely, and, yeah. and what they're yeah, talking about right. is criminal. Yeah, well, it's not only criminal; it is a fucking scandal. Because <clears throat> you know, first of all, can I just say that? Can, can I? I like can I break in just for a sec, James? Just so everybody's gotcha. aware. I know it's alive, so like we we have to talk about breaking news at the same time. Um, Del Duca and Horvath have both stepped down as leaders of their parties. Just as oh well, we're that's good. That's so only that's new blood. Years too late for Horvath, and, and, and yeah. Uh, you know, Just so everybody's aware, breaking news: they both stepped down officially as their uh, party leaders. But sorry, go on. That's the best thing that could happen to either party in so this pod. Yeah, really there cool. you go. Yeah, well, some um, good news but, for the podcast. But Nathan, let's I, be what, honest. What, I mean, in real parlance, they both got uh, eaten alive by their by their gang, right? I mean, yep. That's what happened. We need uh, we need politicians that can stand up to this and call call a spade a spade because there's been far too much uh, politeness coming from what I would call yep. reasonable, decent corners. We need to get angry at this. We need to stand up and say, this is bullshit. We see what you're doing. We see the deals you're making criminally with these profiteers while people are dying in hospital beds during COVID. When people are getting sick, these scumbags are taking needed medical supplies and they are jacking up the price and making it difficult to get into our country. How many people died because of these bastards? No shit. Well, well listen, um, if Patrick Brown was premier and you didn't help uh, oust him, maybe we'd uh, be in a different spot right now, David. <laughs> It'd be worse. It would be worse. That guy is, is nothing but a, a, a strutting egotist and a dictator in the making. He doesn't have any I, 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 no I had more. my experience with Patrick Brown, and I found out uh, from personal experience that uh, his, his word is worth absolutely nothing. Because when, when when David came to me about the Patrick Brown situation, um, I ended up meeting with Brown. Um, 
his, his favorite meeting place was at the Four Seasons in Toronto. Of course um, it was. Yeah. Um, Subtle. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I, I personally, I prefer California sandwiches. But, yeah, uh, can I just say food. that it, it's the people that aren't wealthy that think you're supposed to rent the charter private plane or go to the Four Seasons, but the wealthy people they go to Mel's Diner and shit like that. Like the, the, this is the, the the disconnect that 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 people have when they want to be impressive. But I, I just want to quickly say, Nathan, that. I haven't heard the term red Tory in a long time, and I'm mm -hmm. really glad that you said that. That was that. cool. Be because while it's a throwback, it shouldn't be. Um, no. I don't agree with Stephen Harper with, with, with a lot of his policies, but I respected his intellect. I respected his strategic incrementalism because he didn't want to shock the country into like he didn't want to take 60 percent of the country and shock them into some radical like right wing you know um uh, philosophy or or policy he, he, ac he accepted that there were other views yeah. and I, I i can say in certain things for example the issue of same-sex marriage which had uh, been dealt with by the previous government with with paul martin and yeah. When it came to a vote on that, all the parties were whipped into uh, voting on party lines. And Harper got up, even though it had already been decided, in, in a whipped vote. Uh, he said, this thing has to be dealt with properly. And people, the members of parliament have to vote according to the wishes of their constituents. And he said, even though personally I'm against it, uh, it has to be dealt with. And he allowed an open vote. He knew what the results would be. And he said, okay, now it's been dealt with. Yeah. And he was also very um, cognizant, at least because at, at the time especially, that, um, that reopening the abortion debate would, A, divide the country, but B, probably would have been bad for his party. I, I agree. He was a very pragmatic person. Um, he also was intolerant of fools. Um, it was hard for him in the beginning to to raise a cabinet from a party that had been several different parties with a, a large Western vote. Unfortunately, he had some qualified people from come into his uh, original cabinet, guys like Jim Flaherty, who as a black Irishman, I really loved him. Yeah. Um, and ran things well. And he also did not tolerate uh, any whiff of uh, improper things being done. Um, and we used to think at the time, his critics used to think at the time that he was beholden to radical evangelicals. But the shit that we're seeing now makes us incorrect maybe in that assessment back then. I mean, maybe fundraisers and things like that, but... I was speaking on another podcast, now that I do millions of podcasts a week, it seems, um, that there is a, um, an interesting strategy happening with Pierre Poilievre right now where he is breaking away from a long-standing conservative tradition. It's not even really a tradition. It's a tradition I understand, but I don't agree with, where they would court the special interest conservatives during leadership races and then completely abandoned them and uh, when it came to the election. The abandonment I agreed with because it's not a winning strategy um, for winning elections, except in 2022 where it seems like whenever our next election arrives that he's going to go all in with the mega Canada crowd, especially the religious bent sect of that mega bent crowd. And I don't think they're gonna... demanding it. And they're uh, look, I, 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 I've, I've known Pierre since he was, uh, I think, a 23 year old member of parliament, um, a Franco Albertan, um, who was at the time, the, the first time I met him, met him and sat with him for a couple hours and discussed the world in general, he was Harper's principal secretary and an extremely bright guy. Um, and I've always, on a personal basis, liked him. Um, I, I personally get shocked, and, and David has the inf information, I don't, of, of his relationships 
with guys like uh, Gerald Shapur, who is a- anything but a proper person. Can you expand on that, David? Just because um, it, it, you talked about it today on the show a little bit, but I, 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 let me couch it like this first. Uh, Polyev could um, go all in, like I think he will, but he still was a former Harper cabinet minister, and so I have to believe that he still has a Harper veneer inside his brain about how to govern. And I feel like he would, instead of abandoning them at the election stage, he would abandon them at the legislation stage. What do you think? Let's put it this I way. Actually, that would be better in a way. No, no. Well, Stephen yeah. Harper has such, such weight uh, within the conservative movement in Canada that he was able to call his own shots. If you look back on a piece of footage, CBC shot, uh, when Harper was reelected, I believe it was at, what, 2010? Um, I could have my dates wrong, but the film exists. Sitting in Millionaire's Row are all senior members of the Plymouth Brethren. They were the first people to step on stage and shake the man's hand. The Brethren have been behind the conservative movement for many years. Um, Their involvement has done nothing but increase since Stephen Harper's demise during the last election. He's on the sideline. A lot of the business interests and personal relationship and party infrastructure that he's still associated with has changed. He's still part of the club, but that club is changing. And uh, Mr. Uh, Polyev is a true believer. Uh, Not only is he benefiting from the dark money, the financing coming from these individuals, he's actually part of these sects. Um, He is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, a Seventh-day Adventist, the same as Mr. Chapur. Um, these people attend all of their, their rallies up in Grand Prairie. Uh, they, they use money launderers that they uh, utilize and have church connections. These are all documented connections that have been made. Um, and in terms of the Zoom call, uh, when we were on, I'd like to name those people who were in it because they need to be named because they are criminals. They are people who are committing sedition. They were people who were trying to uh, support a uh, uh, a coup against the Prime Minister of Canada. Those people were Rodney Diplock, uh, senior member of the Universal Business Team based out of New Jersey, I believe. Um, you had Mick Strange, a uh, uh, an individual who came over recently, I believe, from uh, the UK. You have uh, uh, Brad Mitchell from Condike Lubricants in British Columbia, who also oversees the Brethren's uh, series of religious private schools which are, uh, I believe, tax-exempt. And uh, a bunch of them just got support out here for Mr. Kenny. I believe in Ontario they're going to be following suit. Um, and there was also, uh, of course, Gerald Chapur. Uh, underneath this veneer of a QC, what you have is uh, basically the Meyer Lansky of Canada. This man is the bank. All money that flows into the Conservative Party is now going through Gerald Chapur, and Gerald Chapur calls all the shots. Mr. Harper has a back seat in this little operation. It, it was it was Shapur that that uh, organized the call with those people, where the uh, subject of getting rid of the sitting Prime Minister of Canada, and in quotation marks, whatever it takes. Um, it was a call that Shapur facilitated. I don't think he was happy with how it ended. Um, I, I think. He thought he was talking to a uh, a different crowd, um, but it, it, in this case, David and I talked about it after. And David, by the way, reported it uh, to the RCMP, um, and it just went against every piece of moral fiber that we had. Now, Nathan, just to to expand on that, did they? I know we're 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 we're, we're we're tap dancing around it because it was tap danced around probably in that zoom call as well. We're talking about the, um, potential plan to, or, 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 um, uh, to facilitate the death of our, uh, sitting prime minister. Is that what we're talking about? Like we're talking about actually like offing Justin Trudeau. Is that what we're. uh, uh, Again, first of all, I, I want to say, I think it was Brad Mitchell that brought up the fact that, uh, it was him and his people that were behind the scandal against uh, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, of his having illicit sexual relations with a student while 
working as a, the drama teacher at that private school in Vancouver. He claimed to be the one that was responsible for that. Um, yeah, and and Dave, David mentioned this in in the podcast today, and this is like, am I am I right to assume that that was was a false statement? Like that was a, that was totally like like I believe you. Used I don't know. Groom, I don't know. And David used the word groomed today. Somebody was groomed into that story. Is is that allegation against our prime minister Justin Trudeau? Uh, it, was that a false story that was like just like a narrative that was to use like to use against him during the Any, Me Too? Anything is possible, but when the way they brought it up, it's like they created that thing to to ensure that uh, that uh, Justin would not win from from a moral standpoint. Well, yeah, the like person, they were proud the, of the person it. Like, look what he in, did. That made Remember, the it was like he was it. proud of it. They were like, whoa, look what we did. This is great. And and then they brought up, you know, uh, we, we want you um, to help us get rid of Trudeau. And it was a matter of what are you talking about? They said, and their words again, name the price. And I said, what are, you ta- what are you talking about? And I said, what are you talking about? get rid of the prime minister and they said whatever it takes and when a person uh says to me whatever it takes and they believe that i have a a background in certain intelligence agencies known for doing things uh one can see interpreted as they're taking it to the extreme and they put out a full page ad i remember um at the, on the cover of the National Post, they financed an ad that said, we need to replace our prime minister. So when I'm hearing you guys talk about this, I, I'm, I'm thinking like, I mean, Shapur especially doesn't seem like a stupid man. So using ambiguous words like that, you're right. When he's talking to someone with your background, it, could, it clearly could have a context that's very dark. It, it wasn't Shapur obviously... that it was. It was Diplock that said that, not Shapur. Can you tell me who that is? Can yeah, you tell who, me who is that? that? He, he was the, the a senior the person. Yep. He's a senior person in the Brethren, from what I understood, well, from if, the church if, of, of of the church, living in the United States. So you're having a foreigner talking to oh. two Canadian citizens about getting rid of an elected sitting Prime Minister of Canada. "Quote unquote, whatever it takes." That's where I had a fucking problem. Pardon my language. It, it, well, absolutely, and it, and actually, it, it kind of it brings it brings a bit of uh, clarity to the the fact that you, as much as these people are pieces of shit, uh, not a lot of Canadians are calling for the death of our prime minister. But if it's a foreign asset that's kind of just on the fringe, um, either profiteering or I could see it being bandied around to to say something that, you know, laissez faire. Just I'm just gonna say it. Fucking kill he, the he guy. Was dip- like holy he was shit. Dip- he was diplomatic. Nobody said kill him. I, I understand. I, I, what, I, I, whatever whatever it takes. But but nevertheless, you have even if it's a matter of you know expose him for whatever. You're talking about foreign interference right. in our government. Yeah, was there which, a is, price which is tag? unacceptable. <laughs> did they name it? Did they have it? Did they throw a number at you, David? No, they told it? us. They asked us to throw a number more. at them. Whatever, whatever it takes. Oh, I'm sorry. Name the price. Unreal. That's what they no. said to get Marsh. They offered me 150 grand quick delivery on the guy. I mean, I found him in like three days, and. Uh, I stalled it out for a bit until I got the bit of the background, but they're like, "Drop them off. It's 150 k." They don't. These guys have and, and, and for me. Money. It was going to be nothing because I was helping David, and I was going to use my relationships in law enforcement to turn over a person who apparently was a wanted felon over to him. It's when they couldn't provide the warrants, and 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 when Shapur finally admitted to me, well, there aren't any warrants for him. And we're hoping to get one within a year, year and a half from Saskatchewan. But we want 
we want this man. We want you to turn him over. I wasn't being paid a penny. I wasn't offered a penny. I was doing it to help. David came to me saying, this is my problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. I, I'm, that's I, I, it's fascinating. I find it, yeah. I, I find it really, um, what is your, if you've ever spoken about it, Nathan, with your law enforcement friends, what have they said? Is it just too ambiguous to really pursue with the wording or what, what have they, have you talked to them about it? I, I, I've mentioned it in, in passing and I look, I, I've got relationships with law enforcement in a number of countries. Um, but clearly it's a matter of, I, I've talked about it casually. David actually reported the call afterwards and we agreed that he would be the one reporting it. Um, I never filed a formal report about it because I knew it was being reported. Um, okay. But it was, it's off the wall. Somebody coming to me asking me to get rid of my prime minister. No kidding. Because it has a ring to it that, um, and, and, and just like a, um, it, it reminds me of like, like, like it's like 10% of what January 6th was. You know how January 6th to one group of people was like an attempted coup. And to another group of people, it was just a protest, man. It just got out of hand. And really, it depended on what side of the political spectrum that you sat on. But if you don't have a dog in the fight, what it looked like was in the States was a, um, was a deliberate shaking of a snow globe with poisonous snowflakes and, and hoping that they would land on things that they hated. And it feels like this is a similar situation in that we're going to use ambiguous language. Maybe he'll get him ousted. Maybe he'll die. But we don't care because whatever it takes. And, and name the price. Yeah. that. Yeah. You can't is. talk to people like us and give us a budget and say, OK, it's, it's a little bit more than unambiguous at that point. Because if we'd have been engaged for the job and accepted the job, we certainly had the resources to make that happen. Whether it was a, a, a coup by... A, uh, um, political means or 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 it was uh, whichever way you want to go if we were of that mind and we were that type of people that would certainly not be without uh, something that we couldn't have uh, pulled together there's certainly access to those type of professionals so it's a little bit more extreme when you have a a, a religious organization that's not just using rhetoric they're they're putting their money where their mouth is and that's scary. as well as the fact that this is an australian based religious organization that has already gotten in trouble for political interference in, in new zealand that's right they're they're, they're yeah, scandalized yeah. in the uk for using their internal their, their political connections to profiteer on the ppe game um which, which, by the way, is something that also happened in Alberta uh, by Shapur and, and Holman in uh, creating a company. Uh, and, and on this, I have a, a little bit of a, a, a personal end. I, I knew about the, uh, the virus, um, the COVID virus, in advance of the um, general population knowing about it uh, a couple months in advance uh, through a very senior four-star U.S. general who was sending me uh, INS videos of what was happening in China. And was that Spalding? One of the things, pardon? Was that General Spalding? No. No, okay. I, I talked to him in January of 2020, yeah. and he was all over that. Uh, you know, all, this this, all this over, is someone yeah. a, a lot more famous than, than Spalding. Um, and uh, one of the things I did with a, a couple businessmen that I, younger than me, although everybody's getting to be younger than me, um, is, is we, we went out and we got the rights to the tests that were being used uh, by the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. And I, I traveled because in Alberta, Alberta was suffering from the shutdown of the two largest meat processing plants in Canada. Uh, two thirds of Canada's meat processing had been shut down. And I, I traveled to Alberta to introduce the, the tests uh, to Jason and his cabinet and I tested them for COVID and nothing came of that. Other than my finding out that Shapur and Holman, 
created a company from that that Shapur was holding that had been registered to provide oil services, and they became the provider of tests to the Alberta government. Wow. The- Holy shit. Really? Isn't there yeah. a paper trail? Like, like, how yeah, is this legal? there is. And Gerald Chapur have got points in just about everything through That's... one shell or another. I mean, if somebody had a federal inquiry and maybe got a warrant and opened up some of these trust accounts, uh, people might lose trust in the uh, good Queen's Council here. No shit, though. Like, like let me ask you like a question. If... Uh, sorry, I just want—I don't want to huh. lose track of this thing. But we'll, we'll get right back to that. But it's a big I, I just, story. Like... There's. A... A lot of moving yeah. pieces. <clears throat> no shit. <laughs> like I said, we, we're going to need a team of monkeys to do the clips for the show. But, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but the thing is, uh, David, I, I, I need to know when you reported that uh, the, the uh, 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 alleged or supposed uh, assassination uh, uh, request. Um, I had been speaking to a senior RCMP uh, um, uh, officer uh, on another matter, um, Mr. Alan Hallman had been uh, attempting to uh, create a situation where the optics would uh, make it appear the RCMP were uh, guilty of a crime in Alberta. He uh, illegally recorded a meeting that I had between myself and an RCMP officer. Um, He took that recording to the Calgary Police Service and tried to insinuate that the RCMP officer had been tipping off witnesses and, and, and a variety of other things, all of which were demonstrably untrue. Um, I found out about this. Um, I made a report to the Calgary Police Service, spoke to the detective, told him that Mr. Hallman was uh, full of shit and this never happened. Um, I had also spoken to the RCMP officer uh, about the incident that took place with Plymouth Brethren. Due to what happened with Mr. Hallman, he was removed um, from the case uh, just so there would be no impropriety. And to be quite honest, since then, I, I have had no follow up uh, with the RCMP. What was the date? Of, what, was the, what was the date? Uh, I, have I would have to go back. Through. I would really, you know what? You might even what have a better idea of what the dates are now. You've got my papers. You've got the client doc papers. I don't <laughs> even have them. <laughs> I know. Well, well, <laughs> and I haven't seen them. Listen. What was the what, what, what was the year? What was the year? Uh, the, year? the year was 2000. It was the beginning of uh, 2021 that the phone call take, took place. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what I'm trying to do is, is see if I can find a way, a, a breadcrumb trail to the, um, to the emergencies act. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's definitely, there's, there should be a fairly good bread trail in the uh, Klondike papers. But like I mentioned, I think now that you've gotten a hold of them, you understand that I don't physically have those papers anymore right. or the files. Um, that they're in the hands of journalists, and um, you know they've been uh, off off sited to several different locations, just uh, in case Mr. Chapur uh, wants to use some of his legal kung fu to come and and seize my stuff, which he's been known to do in a, <laughs> other brethren cases, which are well documented. Or, or um, by sending you, people to you, David, to try to rough you up. Exactly, and it's it's nice that they send me the people by. I mean, sometimes I get lonely, but uh, I don't need to see too many more of those people. <laughs> well, let's give them all a message here and let them know that those papers are um, not widely, but um, proportionately distributed now, and you can leave David alone um, and yeah. come after every single person that is in reception of these papers because there's a lot. And I would like to officially apply for protection under Nathan's protection, please. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have two standard poodles that are near me. One's a pup. Oh. I, I've got I'll a very lazy spaniel at my feet, and <laughs> yeah. uh, he doesn't but, but understand you, what you, I've been you, reading. You, you brought up an interesting thing, because when you consider what David has been saying in the public media, um, you would think that a, a person like Shapur or Hallman that have resources and connections to the courts and police, etc. cetera, uh, if it was untrue, that they'd be going after him, slapping injunctions on him. But that's not happening. Yeah, this is where your relate this is where the Jason Kenny part of the story um, comes in for me. Because um, despite your respect for him and your friendship with him that goes back many years he is in bed with these people. And 
what yeah. does that I, I, is there I, a possibility I agree that with he you. can be mm -hmm. go ahead I, I i agree with you but personally knowing jason and I, I i again i really respect him and like him and i don't question uh any impropriety uh i would like to say i i think he's just and I hate to use a term about a friend, but he's naive as to how he's being taken advantage of. Can I ask? You know, he, can I ask how the that guy's trying to juggle like, so how, many balls? Can I ask how that friendship yeah. was was kindled? Like, how do you know Jason Kenny? How like how long have you known him? Where where does this friendship start, Nathan? Well, we we went to different schools together. Okay, uh, and I'm joking. Um, <laughs> I was just about to say. <laughs> uh, it wasn't, um, wasn't I wasn't going to give it up. <laughs> yeah, J Jason and I met through uh, the Conservative Party and through um, the election campaign in which uh, Harper uh, won to become Prime Minister. Okay. So you and, and, for... And, and o o over time, look, I'll be frank, one of my interests and one of the reasons I supported Harper and members of his government, like Jason, um, like Pierre, um, was their support of Israel, which of course is something that's very close to my heart. I've spilt, I've spilt a lot of blood for that country. Um, and I, I really supported them on that. And, and Jason was a, a regular visitor as were other ministers uh, to Israel, the Conservative Party, the Conservative government of, of uh, Stephen Harper were very pro-Israel and understood the the realities of the situation, and that was important to me. Oh, J isn't so that Jason, though, isn't, Jason, isn't the... Jason's been to Israel um, in support of of the pro-Israel sector? Well, well look, I. I Took Jason. I introduced him uh, to Bibi Netanyahu. Um, I organized for him to meet um, the head of the intelligence service, other people, senior within the defense establishment of Israel. Um, he he was he and and most of the uh, Harper government were pro-Israel. Isn't there? Isn't one of the reasons why? Um... I find it interesting, and it, because I don't have a dog in a fight, because I'm a recovering Catholic atheist, um, you know. But but I've always found Aren't it intriguing all? the the um, the evangelical relationship with um, with Jewish people, because uh, religious Jewish people, because th um, really at the end of the day, if the end times come, all of a sudden the best friends ever are enemies, <laughs> right? Because Jews are because the evangelicals. They have they, they have earthly common interests, but they have um, the af Idyllic. in the afterlife. They're completely yeah. not friends. Let's put it that way. Well, well, actually, it's, it's one of the things, and, and I'm close with a lot of the evangelicals. Um, and there's guys uh, David, like Pastor John Hagee out of San Antonio. Are those sirens uh, for you, David? <laughs> that, 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 that's the probably coming for me right now. Oh, no one's coming for you, Nick. No, no one's coming. For you. <laughs> um, and anyways, um, the I, I'm I'm close to to members of the evangelical community, and uh, one of the things that, as a Jewish person, that I like about them, uh, unlike other religions, is they don't try to convert me, because their belief is when the Messiah comes, I'll become a Christian. And, and I tell them if that's, that's what I'm told after he raptured us, I I'll, they I'll do it. People, I thought yeah. they raptured well, yeah, well, the people and then left the rest of us here to die. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, even, even even I would do it. I mean, I'm an atheist, but, but if I die and all of a sudden Jesus is there, I'm just like, oh shit, Jesus, I didn't believe in you, <laughs> but now yeah. here you are. So clearly, I'm wrong again. Yeah, exactly. I, I I just I, I have a I have such a really hard time. Like I really do have a hard time thinking that Jason Kenny, of all people, can get behind any sort of religious ideology and um, uh, not uh, use it to 
to forward himself in a conservative uh, platform such as he did with um, gay marriage uh, as he does with abortion rights and and such such things like that and then come across as some sort of a savior for the Israelites I don't I don't understand that well my experience and, and I'll say is he, he's a true friend of Israel okay all right I'll take I'll take you at your word because you're you're friends with them so I, I just but, but I, I've I, also I've also been with him on a number of occasions in Israel um, I was with him um, it was the, I think the 60th anniversary, the liberation of Auschwitz. And he was at the, uh, in, in Poland, in Auschwitz, uh, representing Canada. And I was there as a member of the Israeli Knesset delegation. And rather than going to the Polish president's dinner, we went for a great dinner at a funky restaurant in Krakow. Um, right. But he, he's been Polish very Polish food's strongly, way better anyway. <laughs> Yeah, way better, way it. better. That's, how the, that's the Mel's Diner of Poland. That's just that's the way it exactly is. it. <laughs> um, um, yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I, I appreciate that, and I just, I, I don't, I don't. We're gonna come across different because obviously you have a personal connection. I do not. I just don't. I don't believe in in his public um, displays of 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 uh, brotherly love to uh anybody uh, and and sure if if he's great with the jews good for him uh he just doesn't seem to be great with anybody else uh when it comes to anybody that's not white christian and male so i have a i have an issue with that so um i appreciate i appreciate your candor on that one but um I, we're gonna have to agree to disagree on on uh generalization here so on on, on, on the other generalizations i won't argue but I would argue to the nth degree in terms of his feelings towards Israel and, and the feelings of well, Stephen Harper and, and much of his cabinet. Good. Is Great. There, I mean, he's Catholic, I believe. Um, he's Catholic. a convert to Catholicism. Um, we have we have a is really... it, was he Ju- was he was he Jewish? Like is he no. like what, is, no, no. his parents Jewish? Like, no. What, his, what's his, his what's his tie? What what actually? What what provokes him to be such a a, a pal to Israel? Um, I think his belief of what is right, looking at the only democracy uh, in the region, his having been there, having been among the Arab communities there, the Christian communities there, the Jewish community, uh, seeing a uh, a country um, that that truly is the only beacon in the region and. I've been to every other country um, in the area. Um, he, I, he really... I, I understand you have. I'm talking about him. Like, is it because of Papa Harper, or is it because of some no, sort it's of because like, it, re- it, it, revelation it's, that he's had? It, it's sincere. He look. He was there uh, a number of times that I know of uh, in advance of Harper ever being there, and he was the first person from the Harper government to have met met with uh, Netanyahu. He was the first person to have met with uh, the head of the intelligence service, members of the uh, defense establishment, social establishment. I took him to meet the chief rabbi, and he spent time with him. Um, What year was that? It was over a number of years. um, What was the first year that that happened? My guess is about 2010, thereabouts. So that was a relationship before Harper had with Netanyahu and and the Israelite. Yeah, I I was the one that at the time created the direct relationship with Bibi. Nice. Okay. Benjamin Netanyahu, for those that don't know, was like a legit war hero. Uh, He didn't Um, just come out. uh, He wasn't a political animal like from the very beginning, but like he, he was... At least he, that was his backstory. It could be like wrestling, he, he, you know? No, <laughs> he, he, no I'll, really... I'll tell you. Bibi served, he and his two brothers served in one of the top commando units of the country, uh, the country called Sayert Matkal, the Central Command Reconnaissance Unit. His, his older brother, uh, Yonatan, uh, was killed on uh, July 4th, 1976, commanding one of the units 
in the raid in Entebbe. He was the only Israeli soldier killed in the raid. Uh, Bibi, uh, he, he had a, an, an honorable uh, career. He's, he's fought for Israel. His father was, was such a right-wing politician when Israel was being run by the left that the family moved to the United States because his father couldn't get a teaching position in Israel. And that's why Bibi's English is so great as well as having a degree from MIT, he spent part of his growing up in, uh, in the U.S. But he, he, he's a genuine fighter. And, and I, I can tell you about all the wrong things about him, as, as we all have. And I can tell you about the good things about him. Yeah, yeah, we're not we're not here to solve the Middle East peace crisis, but I'm 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 more concerned like about at least the, the, ten the... minutes. I... <laughs> we can we can do this in eight. We can start. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course, it's always a good start. But I, I I'm just I'm just more um, I'm more interested in, in your in, in the 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 Kenny connection to that, where I I just don't I don't I haven't I haven't seen it. I haven't seen any like why was this not so publicized that this should be it should like coast this guy into majority territory every single time he steps on the stage. Well, look, remember, Jason did a, a great job. Um, he held a, a cabinet position for a long time as Minister of Citizenship, Immigration, and Multiculturalism. And, and nobody in the history of the Conservative Party worked as hard in the area of multiculturalism as Jason did. And, and built bridges, um, not only with uh, the Jewish community, but with the Sikh community, so many communities. He was a, I don't know how many rubber chicken events he went to, but uh, I, I've never seen anybody better in, in doing it. Uh, Patrick Brown, I think uh, David will uh, admit, has done a great job in getting uh, the support of certain minority communities uh, in Vaughan and Brampton. But uh, Jason really worked hard at building bridges with the minority communities. The one I'm most familiar with was uh, the, uh, the Jewish community, although I was also with him, uh, sitting with him at uh, a, a big event that was held by uh, the Christian evangelical community in Toronto. Do, do either of you happen to know what the relationship between the um, the Plymouth Brethren Church and uh, and Jewish organizations? There's none that I know of. There's none that I can imagine. Uh, David can give you a, 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 a more precise answer. But as, as a person who's been active, I'll, I'll tell you, Personally, I had never heard of the Pilgrim Brethren until the matter came up with Marsh. Uh, never heard you of have, them. You, never... you haven't heard of it to the point where you don't even know that it's Plymouth. Plymouth Brethren? Yeah. You, I, <laughs> true. That's, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, yeah that it, man it, is it, telling it, it like it, it is. Yeah. It's, it's real. I had never heard of them until Marsh. And... Right. I, I was shocked when I was hearing how what they would do to both people who remained within the church in, in, in governing them and then to, to those who dared break away from the church. So Marsh was, was my first experience with it. And then through that, learning about their extreme right-wing political agendas and their willingness to use their money, which seems to be very, very deep pockets, to, um, to, to guide uh, the right in the way that they see should be well, done. That's the thing. That, that, yeah. The reason why I mentioned it, and I'll throw it over to you, Ryan, because I think I want to get David back into the conversation on yeah. this point, um, is that... Uh, w first of all, there's no long game in 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 this um, entity 
trying to prop up uh, conservative politics. And the reason why I think that's true, is why there is no long game, is because, like, the... Uh, this, the generalization of the convoy protester of being a white supremacist, let's just say there is a faction of that group that's white supremacist, okay? okay. It's not, not really much of a yeah, stretch. It's not, so it's not just, the majority, yeah. but yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. say that for sure. We'll say that there's a sect. Yep. One of the principles of being a white supremacist is not liking Jewish people at all. Oh, so, yeah. Like, that's you the know basis of it. So there is then this interesting and awful kind of like divide probably within conservative circles between that extreme right and this new sort of extreme right where it, it's like or sorry where, where, where the traditional conservative allies of like jewish organizations and evangelicals I, I i have to say at the time i was not very comfortable with because i'm a non-believer but the way that it's being fr but the way that it is now it's it, I would love to just run back into the waiting arms of the evangelicals. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and, and I don't really safer. want to do that. <laughs> yeah. the They're okay, the guys. Arms. Yeah, yeah. It just sounds like... It, it just, just don't go drinking with them. I don't drink anymore. Well, they're not allowed Lucky to drink. Well, neither right? do they. <laughs> yeah, okay. I was going to say, yeah, they're not allowed right, to drink. Right. But I do, do magic mushrooms, and I would love to see religious people on magic mushrooms. That would be amazing. I don't know if you would, <laughs> you would join me on that. I thought you'd have the, to be the, high. The, the, the Macy's St. Patrick's right, Day though, Parade. David, I'm with yeah. you. <laughs> the Macy's Day Parade. Yeah, um, yeah David, uh, listen, d d we're going to wrap this up soon because I think we're all probably tired. Um, but... It's been a big day. Moving forward, okay. Let's just, let's just do it like this. The, the freedom of a podcast is that I don't have to sit there and be all like um, serious and official, like a registered <laughs> news outlet. Yeah, we're right? not Obvious, we're not we're not stuck up against a clock, so we're good. I'm wearing a Star Wars shirt. Nathan's got an infidel shirt on that he got from some special ops team in Israel. Um, you know, in, like in Afghanistan or, or in Afghanistan. Sorry, the safest <laughs> been... place on earth to wear the yep. infidel shirt. I don't know what you were thinking, dude. But um, <laughs> you know. But the um, you're like my favorite person we... on a podcast ever, Nathan. Just so you know, yeah, no, <laughs> I love you. <laughs> but the, but how how can we approach like some of the stories? Literally, there's like four national stories in this podcast just from what we've been talking about. At least I don't know how to break them. Yes, this is. I, the I can I give have. you. I, I can give you a couple ideas because I think there there's those that are. Let's call them tier one. Let's call them give them, them to first. me off air so Jesse Brown doesn't steal them from me. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I'd never heard of Jesse Brown until recently either. Oh, lucky you. But no, <laughs> James brings up a great point, especially for guys like us. And this is what we do. This is this is our this is our game, right? And we we see something this intimidating, and we see something this um, provoking, and and like worthy of of dis multiple fucking discussions where do people like us start where should we actually start this um ex i don't want to use the word expose because it seems so fucking new york post um where do we start this this in this dive into into trying to tell people in our like our comment section uh, our, our our socials are exploding because of david being on the show today where do we start, David, to to tell people what's going on? You got to follow the money. I mean, these religious organizations, support? these religious organizations, they exist as front for profit. That's what they are. They're not. They're not faiths. They're not uh, opportunities to get closer to God. They're opportunities to get closer to money. Um, so you follow the money, you go through the public registries, you go through the, the, the lobbyist lists, you go through the subsidiaries, the businesses, the shell corporations that these churches and religious organizations own. Pretty soon a very coherent uh, picture emerges and you can point your finger, you can narrow them down. Um, there are a handful of people at the very top who are controlling this fascist movement right now. And when people say that, uh, you know, uh, Ottawa wasn't really in danger. Let me make it perfectly clear. The tools that were used during this convoy, the supposed organizers, maybe they had an idea 
great. Maybe they got started, but trust me, on every level, that was hijacked within minutes. There were people who were well-organized, well-funded, who had a goal in mind, which is to create chaos and which to make the uh, appearance that our government was paralyzed. This was forced. This was the prelude to conflict. People need to wake up to that fact. Part of my job for the last 30 years is to be in every shithole third world place I could be that would pay me the money. We engineered these things. We know what takes place. We know the mechanism because we part of the machine. And what I'm telling you is I didn't like to work in Canada. The Patrick Brown job was uh, an exception. And I, 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 I'm sorry I ever touched it. I'm sorry I ever got involved because when I came home from work, I felt like I could kind of escape and, and be a normal person in a normal country that wasn't ruled by crazy people um, that, that worship uh, whatever God you want to name, uh, whatever religious doctrine they may have. But it's always about the money and it's always about control. And when you find people like, these aren't conservatives we're dealing with, these are fascists. And I think that's important to, to make that distinction. Um, I have con certain conservative leanings financially, uh, you know, with the economy. But that doesn't cut off the fact that I'm a human being and I don't expect people to live exactly like me. And, you know, whoever you love, you love. And uh, if you're not hurting anybody, what do I care? Um, I'd like to see progressive politics with, with conservative fiscal responsibility thrown in. But that's not what this party is. It's been hijacked. And if you follow the money and you, and you look and see where these monies are flowing from and where they're flowing back to, you'll understand that our conservative opposition is a foreign conservative opposition that's bought and paid for. And that's indisputable. Yeah. Good point. And listen, I, I, th I think one very good point. I, and I think one of the things that the media is doing people like Ryan and myself a big favor by literally never reporting any story that's really worthwhile. <laughs> you know, no shit. Like, like they are. Well, they, although, they would... although when when you figure the allegations of the uh, current residents of of Sussex Street in 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 Ottawa as supposedly controlling the press, it's a narrative that is very much to their advantage. But yet the mainstream media is ignoring it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That should tell people a lot about who controls the media in this country. Yeah, I don't know what the answer to that is. It seems like there are, are, are you know, a few um, bad actors involved. Um, but it also feels like um, the media is more afraid of optics than anything else. And start well, they better wake up and, and stop worrying about optics and worry about the people who are making off with their country and their sovereignty gonna... because it's happening right now. They're not no going to. You have so to rely wake the on. Fuck up. Unfortunately, yeah. un and, th and I mean this with all of my heart. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they have to rely on people like me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. To and what we're doing. Stories. I, I, I agree. Because, you know. Well, yeah. when you're when you're bought that? and you're paid Canadian? for. You're no, what Canadian? I'm saying you is, what I'm saying is, it, yeah, no, but listen, what what I'm really saying is, and maybe I should stop saying this stuff out loud and just do these things. But the, what I'm saying is, I don't have an office building in Toronto and a you know 300 and whatever million dollar budget and editors and all this uh, I, I don't have any of that and while that does seem to complicate journalism all of that stuff i just said and Agreed. i feel more free it, it becomes a really difficult thing and, and look at i have the courage to do it, and and i i will make a pledge here to try to break every story i can inside that inside the the klondike dossier that i have and 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 do, mm -hmm. do it the right way i don't want to get killed though i had that same to, thought today too just so you know <laughs> yeah. to, 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 to go to what what you're saying no you don't have the resources of uh of skyscrapers and unlimited or a, any government budgets whatever which you know gives you the freedom but also from a military standpoint looking at my military background uh, I'm a believer that guerrilla warfare in today's world is the most effective warfare that there is. And that's what people like you are waging. And in the same way that 
major militaries in, in our lifetime um, with all the resources could not take countries like Vietnam or Afghanistan because they're up against guerrilla fighters. That's what you guys are. Well, can I can, can, I, can give I, that, I give that moving, analogy moving today forward, as well. Mo- moving, sorry, Ryan, I'll just I'll pass it to you one no, second. Okay. But moving forward, I was just hoping, Nathan, can I tell people that you're my protector? <laughs> Please? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, right? Yes. yes. And, I, and, I, and you can tell them that my dog, Tikva, the 13-year-old poodle, is behind you as well. Yeah. <laughs> Whew. Got it. Got it. At least the poodle isn't uh, Pierre Poiliev, so. Yeah. <laughs> Are we sure? Let's all fuck his no. name up one more time. Actually, when I saw your poodles, it reminded me of the debate watching Patrick Brown and Pierre go at it. It looked like a couple of little poodles barking at each other. I wondered when they're going to start sniffing each other's ass. Yeah, well, no I'll shit. Tell you, David, you saw my experience with Patrick Brown. And, and guys, David, after putting me together to try to help Patrick Brown, um, after the first meeting I met him, I gave him some conditions for which I would help him, which he broke momentarily. And the second meeting was basically telling him to go fuck himself. <laughs> Wonderful. Which he did on camera for some reason, because <laughs> this is the same guy who good. called me Patrick Brown in January of 2018. And Nathan, you know, this to be true. He called me after having my name and number passed to him because three months before a mutual friend of ours, a gentleman named Terry LeClaire had passed him the information that he was going to be removed. They laughed at it. So, of course, when it came to pass, he called me. This is the same guy who begged on the phone if I could get help from the Russian Federation, he would do anything for them. There's a real solid guy, guy who's willing to sell his country out just to win a bloody election. I'm sorry, but I'm sick of these people. I'm he sick also sold out his own principles. He sold out his own principles in this league. He didn't sell them out. He never had well, any. My, my experience with him was that I, I would find out what was done to him and how it was done on the condition that he focused on dealing with things other than the party and to leave the party alone because it was too close to an election. And we agreed on that. And I went home and within an hour, I'm watching him on CP24 or whatever, talking about how he's going to go and reclaim the leadership of the party. I did find out what, what, who did things to him. And when we met, he said, did you find out? I said, yeah. And he said, well, tell him, I said, go fuck yourself. (laughs) Can I, can I ask you two a question? And I don't, uh, whoever answers first is fine, but I, I'd like an answer from both. Ooh, and the question round. is, how do we, how do we go about in the position we're in now and what we know and where we like our actual stance, where we're, where we're sitting here as a, as a country, as a province, as a, however you want to look at it, how do we fix the conservative party? tomorrow like if we were to if we were to go out tomorrow and say i want to bring some credibility back to this party how do we do it you might want to find some conservatives instead of extremists good point. that's the problem right now they, they've, um, they've gone they've gone hard right is what you're thinking dave they've, they've gone beyond hard right they've they've gone into open revolt i mean when you have groups of people advocating for for you know, the removal or the murder of a sitting political leader of a country, you've crossed a line that you can never get back over. It's over at that point. You've lost your mind. You've lost your your way. I mean, my whole career, I was always willing to go a certain, to a certain extent. But if you keep selling pieces of yourself, if you keep, keep breaking rules that you have for yourself, then you end up worse than your enemy. And that's the position that these people are in. I mean, you have to somewhere draw a line. Yeah. Do you disagree with your political enemies? Uh, sure. Can you find common ground? Well, if you're reasonable as a human being, you can. Um, but if you've got such a hard line and if you don't do things this way, if you don't worship a certain way, if you don't have this. Sorry, there was a big, big reason why church and state were separated. For this very reason, because the combination of church and government leads to fascism. 
There's no right. other way. Yeah. History will show you that this is correct. And that's where we're heading today. And we need, we need to, I, I believe a national inquiry is called for. I think that if Canada really gets to the bottom of where this dark money is flowing in from, that uh, we won't have enough prison cells. Shit. Nathan, Nathan what do you think? Do, what, do we, what do we need yeah. to do tomorrow? To fix the conservative parties, frankly, that's too big a question for, for me. Um, a, I, I agree with David. I think we need a proper national inquiry. And it's, it needs to be an apolitical one. And you need to have a special group that attacks it. Um, I would go, from my experience, I, I'd start, I'd, I'd polygraph everybody who's sitting in parliament. And, and, and everybody that's sitting in a decision-making position when it comes to finance and things like that in government. And uh, that, that's one way. Uh, it, it would scare the hell out of a lot of the people. Um, look, companies in, in Israel, I learned from a person that I have served with that provides special work to major corporations around the world uh, in terms of technology and things like that. And he taught me, uh, you know, first of all, he said, I, I trust everybody after I've listened to them for a few hours. So he has the technology, but uh, what, what, what it is, polygraph them. Start, start by doing random polygraphs. Force a, a sense of fear, polygraphs. Of, of, of fear. That's what they should call them. <laughs> no, seriously, force, force a sense of fear on people. Um, it's actually not a bad idea to like every caucus meeting should start with a round of polygraphs. You know, oh, how dare you? I've had so many fucking alcoholic beverages tonight and you use the word caucus. I'm Don't sorry. say caucus. I'm sorry. I'm going to can hold Klondike I'm, lubricant I'm caucus. That's <laughs> <laughs> what they are. Um, you know, and that's listen, the shame of it because these people who are so intolerant of other people's lifestyle, uh, you know, I, when I looked into certain members of this church, I certainly found some people that had some alternative lifestyles. And that's none of my business. Isn't that that's funny, my though? Point. It's yes. nobody's business. As long as it's legal, as long as nobody's being heard, who the hell cares? And if you do care, you should ask yourself a question. Why do you care so much? That's it. Yeah. Is it because you know, to, go, to go back to our current prime minister's father, a true statement that he, he made, was that uh, politics has no room in the bedrooms of the nation? One hundred percent. Balance the budget. Thank God. I am no, I am no liberal, but you know what? That's one thing I fucking totally agree with. Because if you think about it, it's conservative at the fucking heart of things. I don't care what you do. It's the most libertarian, conservative fucking point of view. Is what you do behind your closed doors and is not regulated by the government. That's Just what run that's the all about. run the government honestly and properly, please. Absolutely, yeah. Be loyal 100%. to your constituents, even, even you if you it. don't do I, a very good job. If you make mistakes because you're trying, they all hey, will. Can, exactly, but uh, you know, there's a big difference between incompetence and uh, and corruption. And uh, what we're seeing right now, uh, especially from some of these people who are spying, aspiring to be leaders of of, of one of the most uh, impressive countries on God's green earth, Canada. Um, what we're seeing is a hell of a combination of incompetence and massive corruption. And uh, we've got a little snake oil salesman who's running around telling everybody how he's going to fix all our problems by setting the country on fire and setting us against each other. It's not how you fix a problem. We need to we need to have responsible growing up leadership who want to come to the table and address issues, real issues, not hate, not division, not start screaming slogans from a rooftop. Let's have discussions like adults. I mean, enough of this bullshit. We're one country. We're one people. And until we figure that out, we're in a whole heap of trouble. I, I think, you know, there's one thing that the four of us can certainly agree on. We're all old enough, long in the tooth enough. This isn't the Canada that we grew up in. Absolutely and, not. And I, I want that Canada back. I have a 21-year-old daughter. And... I want her to be able to live in a country like what we grew up in 
and that doesn't exist today. Mine's 15. I, I, yeah. I totally agree. My my daughter's 15 years old, and, and I I fear for it. And it's one of those things that, you, oh, you always think about what you're going to do for your kids. And, you, and as they get older, it becomes more prominent in your mind. You're like, fuck, they were right. I, I wasn't afraid of anything <laughs> until I had my daughter. Absolutely. Oh my I, I'm a guy that I, I've, been, I've been shot twice. I've been in hairy-ass situations all over the world. And, and the thing that I'm most afraid of is, is what my daughter's inheriting. Because we're watching, we're watching, we're watching people that literally want to rewind Take the clock away what we on have. her, on yeah. her, uh, on what she, what, what, what people have done for her, and your and, daughter, my daughter, James's daughter, J David. I'm sorry, I don't know. You have children. I've I got, I've got a fully grown uh, daughter, and I've got uh, two small children. But uh, that's you're it, right. You they know? do want to rewind the clock. They want to take away a woman's right to choose. They want to they want to make it risky we're going to have women that are have to go into back alleys to get abortions this is sick yeah. this and this is you know what going back I, my, is never the way forward you're right that is, that's right and my, my daughter um is five years old she already has to deal with all the pressure of being the most beautiful child on the planet oh, so i don't Biden. really know look at that you know, face she's, she's precious that's more dickhead she, she, she's because you like, run the show i would have totally I I could have put a picture of my kid up. You the, the only the only yes. question I have is the perfect who, who, podcast to do that. What the fuck was I thinking? I, I, I <laughs> my my question looking at you is, is my question: the Who is the is father? So beautiful. Yeah, so yeah beautiful. right. Yeah, you know uh, what? Probably probably me. Just so no, I'm well, more, that that, that is a very a bad joke. Round. Um, because <laughs> no one no one but me would be willing to tolerate my wife to sleep with her. So I don't really understand <laughs> what the. But we she as Canadians, we owe your daughter, me. we we owe your kids, we owe my kids, we owe every kid. You're we right. owe them all a Canada that is safe and 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 progressive. That and we and, got, we did it. Yeah, we had that. We we owe what? them. We owe got it. them. Yeah. And no, if we right. keep going down this road, that's lost. Yes, sir. Well, listen, I, guys. I I, got, um, I think we're going to wrap it here. Uh, first of all, it's twelve oh six. Um, Nathan, I was told by David that your bedtime was about a half an hour ago. Um, I'm not sure if that's true. <laughs> well, but, um, you know, I, 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 I'm sipping on my warm milk as we talk. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> by warm milk, I mean I whiskey, please... and by I, I want your a shirt. little bit, I mean a lot. <laughs> I want the single malt. Somehow. Yes, yes, no. right. <laughs> no Canadian um, whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, I, I would love to have both of you on again. Nathan, if you'd be yeah. willing to come back, that'd be great. I also want to keep our communications open because, uh, you know, to, to the audience that was, dude, like we, we've we maintained basically the same audience from the beginning to end, which is amazing. Um, I, I, I will make it my mission um, to, to break as many stories from this dossier as I possibly can in Absolutely. a way that is professional and in a way that is in your face. I'm thinking to myself right now, what would the conservatives do if this was all reversed and they would be attacking relentlessly and rightfully so, you know, if and it would be on every major off, platform too. We if someone, was gonna, if someone talked openly about offing Stephen Harper, there is not a chance in hell that that wouldn't be a national story the day no. after it happened, Shit. you know, and I just and, feel like that would be the right call too. And, and yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, having been around the world and with a lot of government leaders, in a lot of places, Canada is one of the easiest places if somebody had the nefarious goal to dispose of our leadership. Um, as much as I, I really like and respect the RCMP, um, but our leadership is not protected like it is in other countries. Absolutely. And when you have and when you have religious zealots, and and I truly use the word zealots because that's what they talk to us in that way um had they talked to people other than david and myself we might be talking about a different prime minister today and yeah. what what you know that's i i like i like justin on a personal basis i'll disagree with him politically on things i'll have discussion with it but he's my prime minister yeah, yeah. That's why I, I was That's always a fair like, statement. The, the whole the whole fuck Trudeau flag thing was always to me like, listen, I know there's more important issues than profanity, but this says a lot about you. You know, if that's and the it's, flag and that you it, it's that identity politics that we have as Canadians have never subscribed to in the past. And we've literally picked this up like a virus 
from yep. our neighbors to the south. The fucking meth lab downstairs emanated through the vents, and we fucking yeah. sucked it up, and and for some reason it became fodder for mainstream media here, and they love it. Yeah. They lo- and no. even if even if it was, it's it's clickbait. It's literally clickbait. We're living in a, a clickbait world when it comes to media. Not even the bot and paid for, but just it's if, if it bleeds, it reads, and and we're watching it. So yeah. Well, let me um, give you an general. example. There's 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 one guy I wanted to get his name in. Um, the late Gord Brown, Gordy Brown, um, mm-hmm. conservative. Uh, he was a guy that uh, uh, Justin actually marched across the floor for. Remember Breastgate when he yep hit the. Uh, yeah, it was Elbow funny. Gate. Gordy Gordy Elbow sat Gate. on a committee, an intelligence committee, um, which protected like elected officials. Um, Gordy took that job really seriously, and uh, where there were other uh, questions about the safety of the prime minister, Gordy asked me to look into certain things, which yeah. I did. This guy didn't care whether you were a liberal or conservative, NDP. Gordy was a fucking hero, and he was a patriot to this country, and uh, I miss him a great deal. Um, I knew him in a very off record way and, uh, would take jobs from time to time to look into things. But Gordy Brown, I think what's really important was a Canadian hero. He, uh, he kept politicians safe, no matter what strike that was. I just wanted to get in there. You'll find that in my yeah. papers, James, but, uh, yeah, that's yeah, something I, I think can... I owe his family this really, many years really later. They need him. to understand it, what a yeah, brave guy it, he was and, uh, what a good Canadian he was. Yeah. I will definitely look that up in the papers if I live long enough to get through them all. Um, which... <laughs> well, I, I thought you're moving into my spare bedroom. <laughs> Whatever you we need, have an entire brother, team. Whatever you need. Listen, I live right near the Our Lady Seat of Wisdom College. I'm already on their shit list because of the things that I write about them in the local paper. Um, then the last thing I need is, is it, yeah, Nathan, I'm serious. Big Daddy, I need your help. <laughs> well, I need your help. If you like my infidel T-shirt. I have another one. You know the way the evangelicals had as their motto, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Yes. I have a t-shirt that says, what would Bubba do? Oh, my God. Like from Forrest Gump? Yeah. That Bubba? Bubba Gump? I want that. There's (laughs) garlic shrimp. Yeah, no, I like that. Um, Oh, do you have a Bubba shrimp? You do. Hang on. You have the hat. (laughs) Sorry, and we're gonna wrap when guys. Ryan comes back. But Ryan, if we're if we're gonna if we're gonna talk about merch, and we're talking about T-shirts, oh, this isn't the same one. But anyway, check out our merch store because we have fun stuff that's political too. <laughs> I grabbed the Leafs one. Ryan. There, yeah, sorry, <laughs> I grabbed I grabbed the Leafs one. The Leafs oh, one boy. is pretty good. Oh, the decades of decades of oh, disappointment. Boy. Disappointment, yeah. Right. Well, so... I, I, I'm a season's ticket holder, and every year they break my heart. And I, You're... I said they, Nathan... their new motto should be Toronto Maple, Maple Leafs breaking your heart since 1968. Okay, yeah. no, 67. But okay, Nathan. That no, they won in explains... 67. Well, they've been breaking explains... hearts in 68. <laughs> that explains a lot of things, actually. Now, I think you're still an asset because if you can afford season's tickets to the Leafs, you're getting paid yeah. by somebody, you son of a yeah. bitch. <laughs> or you, you can take the first three letters of asset. <laughs> I'll note, guys, gentlemen, seriously, I will have you both back. Ryan, you're a fixture, so you, you know you'll be back. Um, and yeah, thank you guys. Like uh, first of all, this was a really interesting podcast. Second of all, um, the openness in which you speak of this stuff is, to me, the um, the the good, the most positive circumstantial kind of evidence that you guys are speaking truth. And um, the fact that we have receipts with the Klondike papers, uh, all of these things matter to me. Um, they matter to me greatly. We're having uh, Richard on the show tomorrow. Excellent. Um, and, and we're going to get to the bottom of his excommunication and all the stuff that he went through. But... Um, Again, thank you for coming, and uh, and we'll see both of you soon. So I appreciate you guys coming to the show. Thank Thanks you very so much. It was great to see you. Bye, guys. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah. That, bye. Now. Um. Yeah. This is. Oh, I accidentally removed. It. Um. This is one of those podcasts that uh, you know makes me realize that this is exactly what I want to be doing. <laughs> You know, um, I accidentally ejected you, Ryan. If you can hear me, can you just come back in so we can wrap up like normal people? <laughs> because-
Jesus. Um, but guys, I, I, there's so much to unpack. And, and, you know, the journalist in me needs to be really careful. The podcaster in me wants to like, you know, climb all over it. Um, I think one of the things that we learned today is that we have, uh, a country in crisis. Um, our politics, our media, you know, our electorate, we, we have a trifecta of, of problems, uh, of, of that are, that are now at, at, at a viral level. Like we're, we are not escaping these problems anytime soon. There is, uh, there is hope that we can, we can figure out how to navigate our way out of this. Um, there is hope that I learn how to use the buttons on the podcast. <laughs> um, I just, but, uh, I, it was all frozen. I was talking to nobody there for like fucking the last 35 seconds. Oh, that's great. why you weren't interrupting me. That's Wasted. Amazing. That's good. <laughs> Leave um, me alone. Yeah, no, I will. Any second now. Um, no, no, you won't. But, but we did have a, um, this is going to take a the Patrick Brown story itself took up like six months of my life, like from morning till night. That's what I did. Okay. This archive. I, I, I'm going to be like 50 by the time this is uh, we're done unpacking this. Oh, hey, yeah. Mike. Look at that. Smooth. That's how fucking late we are. I'm like pulling my <laughs> yeah. cords and I yeah, my no, uh, I, I didn't catch what you were saying, but is this the size of the dossier is that what you're talking about i was basically saying that i'm i think that our country is in crisis i think that our politics yeah. our media and our electorate are in crisis and i think that um this dossier i i i, I do the, all of a sudden it's become like my number one priority to see a how much of it is both true and provable yeah and b um to break as many of these stories as I can. And you know what? It's funny because I was never a guy motivated by things like money or my name in like on a byline, things like that. If I wanted that, I think I could have had that. I could have played the game, right? Like I, yeah, I could have, for sure. you know, but yeah. I didn't want that. I am like genuinely worried about our country more today than I was yesterday. Same here. Yeah. Especially after that, that talk we had, um, today on the show and I've got to agree with you and I've been I've been pretty deep on the inside of things in the past where I knew things were happening and it was one of those I, I could tell the story and it, people would be like yeah well we we always knew that and you see it but then when you hear it from from a, a, a perspective of somebody that was orchestrating it that's that's different because then you hear the intent and you hear the you hear the uh the malice of forethought that was behind it and it's fucking terrifying like that's t that it's literally uh, big screen worthy at this point like if if we were to even even if even if we scratch the surface and we find out that 10% of this shit is right? as like like concrete this is huge. Like this is fucking big. Yeah, uh, and here we are. Yeah. <laughs> you and me. You know what I and mean? we're like, the gatekeepers yeah. of this <laughs> country-saving effort. It's a good we're thing I don't this. drink. It's a good thing I don't drink anymore. Oh, Jesus it's a good Christ. thing I do because I swear yeah. to God, I don't think I, I can <laughs> handle it with, if I without a fucking some sort I of a may cocktail. Start again. I you may should... just you know like. This is very stressful. I don't know how to relieve my stress with, without taking my clothes off. And and so, you know, like I need to do long ball way... yoga like Lachlan does. My balls are right up to my taint where they belong. Um, <laughs> listen, I don't know why we're ending it on taint, but we are. Um, Here we are. Just yeah. Be lucky uh, James... we didn't bring up a poop joke for you. Dude, show. you're James DeFiori now. I am. Oh, it's because I'm in as an admin. I'm sorry. That's man. I am all over. I feel like I have a hacker on staff. <laughs> yeah, you fuck. You fuck with every show on our network. I swear I to God. I didn't even do it. I just you're didn't like clean, clean. I didn't clean my own assets and my title before I left. But no one does. You know, you got to keep an eye. No, on exactly. Um, Ryan Lind, James D. Fiore from the Sheeple Shepherd Podcast. No, Ryan. Lind <laughs> Thanks for joining us. I have a funny feeling that we're going to be seeing a lot more of those two. 
I really um, hope so. Actually, to tell you the truth, I um, I had that thought today, and I'm really excited to uh, to work with them to try and go through that entire fucking and and people don't realize we've seen it. Okay, we've seen this. You, you you're hearing us talk about the Klondike um, papers. We've seen them now, um, but we've only seen obviously enough that eight hours will allow. Um, there is literally four gigs of fucking evidence in those papers. So it's a matter of going yeah. through it. And yes, we may not be mainstream media. We may not be, you know, oh whatever you want to call it. But I would hope that you would think that we're going to present it to you guys in the audience as though I would present it to my wife or I would present it to my neighbor and be like, holy fuck, guys, check this out. Look yeah. what I just found. If I found it yeah. on the street, you know, like that that's what podcasting like that's the the beauty and the license that we get while we're in here. And I, I I'm excited for that part. I'm just not excited for the fact that does this mean we have targets on our backs now? Because we have this in our position. Well, I don't know if you were listening, Ryan, but we have Big Daddy uh, Jacobson, who is going to become our protector. And that to me, is, I, like, look, I, I'm sort of joking, but I'm not really joking. Like, I, I, you know, like we need I, I'm not I'm going to feel more comfortable if I can have a former Mossad agent as my, as my backup. Allegedly, maybe. Who knows? He's got attack poodles so? for fuck's sakes. He's we'll got an fine. infidel shirt he got in Afghanistan. That is the <laughs> toughest fucking guy I've ever met. Like, you don't do that. Um, but, you know, all jokes aside, I'm really tired. Um, and yeah, and I too. think um, this day was a long day. But tomorrow is basically day one of um, of seeing what we can do as far as um, breaking stories by early next week. Agreed. Say. Agreed. And, and we've got, let's do this uh, together. Let's do this as, an, as, oh, as a family. You know, yeah. like. Oh, yeah. Um, my. Me, you, and Dean are probably going to be mostly involved in this, and I, I think that um, working together on this is going to be. This could change the whole game. Like, I think you know. this might actually change some things here. To tell you the truth, um, mm -hmm. uh, be it good or bad, uh, but at the end of the day, I don't care as long as it's the truth. I'm fine with whatever outcome comes from it, and. Um, if that's what we uh, either the the hill we prevail on or the hill we die on, I'm happy as long as it's true. That's so. and, and I'm just kind of happy to know that if I do end up getting murdered, yeah. that it might not be my wife, which is no, it probably won't be now. Now yeah. we've we've given options to the police when they're investigating your death. It's going to be great. <laughs> well, I'll actually, if my wife is listening, you're probably in a pretty good <laughs> position to actually kill me. She's because, but I know you're not listening. But if you were, because now you could just blame it on the crazy church. Like it's never been a greater time for you to. It was me. definitely so. a religious, uh, a religious homicide. Yeah. That's right. um, uh, before before yeah. we go, really quickly, uh, yeah. if I don't, if you don't mind, and because and the only reason why I'm doing this is because it's so late at night. I thought it would be fun, and we have a lot of our our regular uh, guests um, joining us in the chat. Um, coming soon to the Dean Blundell Network is a uh, very cool um, idea that we have come up with, and it's going to be a uh, Dean Blundell show roundup, uh, a weekly podcast of some insider dirt on the hosts, on the guests. Uh, you might oh. see some things you missed in the show, a little more of a deep dive, uh, getting the fans involved as well. So if you are a regular subscriber to the show and you are a regular contributor to the show, you may be pulled by a certain somebody that might live in my house to join her on her new podcast called the DBS Roundup. And uh, that'll be Oh, this is Ashley's podcast? Yeah, this will be coming up in the next couple of oh, weeks. Right. Uh, I didn't tell you. I probably should let her tell you, but she's asleep and I'm drunk, so I can tell everybody whatever the fuck I want. So I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Let her. Let her. Excuse me. Allow her. Allow like, her. I'm sorry. Allow. Okay, okay, I shouldn't okay, have said okay. let. I should have said allow. Right. Because of the church thing. Yeah. You're <laughs> no, right. I'm sorry. You're right. Under um, his that eye. That sounds everybody. awesome. Um, yeah. It's actually, gonna be a good time. She's on not only like super smart, but she's fucking hilarious and she's great and you know what it, she she's when we do a sheeple shepherd podcast i'll i'll be i'll i'll level with you guys she does all the work when it comes to research um i am literally there just as a bounce ball and 
it's her that drives every all the content is driven by my wife so she's incredible as a host and uh you're gonna love this uh this this roundup thing is it a solo thing is she gonna be by herself she's gonna be by herself but she's going to bring on uh guests every show uh be it a fan like it could be a fan of the show it could be one of us from yep. the network, she can bring on whoever. She can bring you on. She can bring Bonzi on. She can bring Dean on. She can bring whoever uh, whoever she uh, deems uh, needs to be on to explain some things further that we speak about on the show uh, every day at three o'clock. So, okay, um, that's great. I, yeah, it's a bit of wait. it's a bit of a rip off of uh, like you know like the Talking Dead and the Howard Stern wrap up show idea, but it's, no, it's very not. good and uh, it's interactive, and we want to make sure that we're giving a little more back to the fans um, that do subscribe and they come in here and they they dedicate their uh, their 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 time with us. We want to make sure they get a bit of a voice if they want to come on and chat some shit. It's going to be a good time. So. Awesome. Thank you for letting me use the end of your show to plug that. No, um, I'm, I'm not even going to like take you out and then say anything for another five seconds. We're, no, we're it's okay. Take, no, do it. Yeah, no, no, no. close it out. Um, I love you. Fuck Good that. night. And thanks for having me tonight. I love you too. Okay. Love you too. Um, Ryan Lindley, Sheep or Shepherd, Sheeple Shepherd podcast and the Dean Blundell show. Um, I have nothing to say. I think I've said it all. I think you guys need to go to bed. I'm going to call my muse as soon as this is over. So don't go to sleep yet. Um, <laughs> and we're going to see you next time on Blackball tomorrow. <clears throat> actually, uh, Richard Marsh, the man that we were talking about tonight <clears throat> that got excommunicated from the Plymouth Brethren cult. Um, and we will talk to him tomorrow. Until then, thank you guys for joining us. I love you all very much. And we'll see you tomorrow on Blackball. Black ball, black 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 black